what I'm talking about today is really something that I think I've become branded a little bit as a maladaptation person. I have been spending my last essentially 25 years talking, thinking about adaptation and development. And somehow recently a critical voice on adaptation has now has turned into an sounds like I'm being anti-adaptation, but I'm not anti-adaptation. I think we should just do adaptation better. But maladaptation is quite a fascinating concept. And I think that for many of you who have development backgrounds, it will be sort of the notion of maldevelopment, of bad development practice, development projects gone wrong will resonate. It's very much the same thing here. So uh, I will talk a through a little bit about adaptation, about the con context here, and um, and then kind of delve into some of the work that I've had the chance to be involved in with lots of partners from around the world. Uh, and the paper that was just referred to is also a, a, a collaborative effort. And I would say I'm definitely um, uh, just one of the people contributing to it. But I think that it has really interesting messages. So I'll talk a little bit about it, but not go into it too much detail, because I think that when we start unpacking, it becomes a bit too technical. So talk a little bit about adaptation, about maladaptation, why this has suddenly become such a big deal now. I finished my PhD in 2004, 2005. Um, don't ask me why it's two years. But the even then, I was talking about maladaptation. I mean, it's not something totally new, but suddenly it's become really important. We know some things, but we also don't know everything. And I think this image, which I don't really know where it comes from, I have to be honest, it's still in this image. But when I lived in Vietnam, it was circulated um, as sort of saying this is this is what Ho Chi Minh, where Ho Chi Minh City was lots and lots of flooding, if you're familiar with it. And so we were saying this is kind of a typical situation that the drains are built so that they're not actually letting the rainwater drain out. What I would say, maladaptation. So I want to start with. A key message from the IPCC Working Group 2 that came out last year, which I hope at this point you all know just as well as I do. Uh, the scientific evidence is unequivocal. Climate change is a threat to human well-being and the health of the planet. Any further delay in concerted global action will miss the brief, rapidly closing window to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. Here I want to emphasize this brief window of opportunity. Uh, really what we need to do now is act and act quickly. Remember that and I'll come back to it. The synthesis report that came out earlier this year had a really nice figure here showing how incredibly fast the impacts of climate change are affecting us. And through, through as many of us in this room probably have children, thinking about the impact of climate change on our children, it's already going to be significantly more than we've experienced in our lifetimes. So the way that we think about this, the way that we're trying to address this is basically we follow two tracks. We talk about reducing the cause of the problem, so obviously mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, but then also adapting. And earlier adaptation wasn't considered to be such a big deal. I would say when I did my PhD, there were a handful, I mean, there was a, well, a handful, maybe that's a, bit, a large handful of papers, uh, but there wasn't, I would think that by the time I finished, I had actually read everything that had been published. That's impossible now. And I will say even for IPCC chapters, reading everything on, on adaptation, there's just no way you can read everything. There's so much written now. So we have a huge amount of knowledge, um, and but where are we? We're not reducing greenhouse gas emissions even though mitigating is still the most important thing we have to do, we're on track, not at all, to staying below 1.5. In fact, it's more like 2.7. So that puts, again, emphasis on the need to adapt, right? If you look at the UNEP uh, adaptation gap report that came out last year, they had uh, counted the number of plans that had been done. The policies are plans, sorry, it's planning, adaptation planning. So it's the number of, of countries that have plans, uh, you can see has absolutely exploded since the year 2000. And now we even have some countries that are in on their fourth round of adaptation plans. So there's lots and lots of planning going on. If you look at projects, a little bit of a, a kind of a gap in 2019, there were some climate finance bumps that happened around then, but but actually we're, we're getting a steady increase of projects on adaptation. I'm not sure it's just gonna to continue to go up. But at the same time, 
this paper came out earlier, I think it was in May, and um, I can't see without my glasses when it was, maybe you could, uh, yeah, in May. This paper, if you missed it, it says basically that they projected that by, if we stay on this 2.7, end up with 2.7 degrees of warming by the end of the century, a third of the world's population are going to be outside this human climate niche. And that means not living in a place with that, where they can actually survive. So that puts even more pressure on needing to figure out how can we adapt to this changing climate. But as you will have known, if you read the IPCC report last year, there are limits to adaptation. And this is something that's really important. We've known about these limits, but we now can couple them really to temperature changes. And we can see that above 1.5, many adaptation strategies become less effective. In particular, what's important is that uh, ecosystems simply can't manage above 1.5. So if we're talking about ecosystem-based adaptation, for example, we need to recognize that that only works as far as the ecosystem, until the ecosystem no longer are able to, to support us. But we also have what we call uh, soft limits and hard limits for humans. And in a hard limit is, for example, the lack of fresh water that we find at 1.5 degrees for those living in islands or in mountainous areas that rely on, on um, glaciers and snowmelt for their water. They can't live in those places any longer if they don't have any water. Soft limits we talk about are things like education and financing. These are things that we can change so we can improve education so that people can shift out of really climate sensitive livelihoods, for example. But they're effectively hard limits if we don't have the political will to be able to change them, right? So they will, their limits is hard, can be hard limits. And as we get to two degrees, it goes, of course, much worse. Uh, and hopefully we won't have to think about this, although, yeah, just to be optimistic. So there's pressure, we have a closing window of opportunity, we have adaptation after a certain point is not going to be as effective. So we really have an incentive to keep, to stay below 1.5. So what do we know about adaptation? Does it actually work? Is it worth putting effort into it? So we have about 15 years of adaptation projects and programs now kind of, uh, of experience around the world. Lots of different organizations have put together different numbers of how much funding uh, we would need for adaptation. I'm not gonna comment too much, but I do think that most of these figures are completely, uh, you know, totally below what we actually need, but it's hard to put a number on these things. There is a continued unresolved debate about the difference between adaptation and development, um, which I was just talking to Dawa earlier today, my student. The, the fact is I wrote my PhD on that. What is the difference between adaptation and development? And we're still thinking about this. What is the difference between adaptation and development? It's quite uh, frustrating to see that this continues to be something that we're not really able to overcome. But the real problem is that we don't have very good evidence of what effective or successful adaptation is. Part of the problem lies in this, and this is something that was developed in 2006 when there weren't that many adaptation projects around. It's a continuum, adaptation continuum, that basically says we have, on the one hand, an impact focus in projects that really just look at, you know, the, what has climate change changed. But on the other hand, we have some projects that actually look at what what's driving our vulnerability to climate change. Why do we even worry about climate change? Most projects, however, only focus on the impacts. They don't actually look at and try to address these underlying drivers of vulnerability like gender inequality or um, you know, religious marginalization or that sort of thing. And you can understand why it's not easy stuff to, to, to address. Now also though, unfortunately what we see is lots and lots of evidence that adaptation isn't not just not working but it's actually making people worse off. So maladaptation, this is a definition and I use specifically it's from 2001, just to reinforce the fact that it's not a new concept. It still is the same thing. It's an adaptation that does not succeed in reducing vulnerability, but increases it instead. I love to use this photo. This is from Fiji. Um, and it is a, a wall that was put up around a coastal sediment to protect it from <laughs> increasing sea level rise and coastal erosion. When they put the wall up, they didn't consider the fact that it also rains and that the rainwater actually has to drain. Even though I know the wall looks a bit funky, you'd think, well, it's got enough holes in it that the rainwater can drain. You can also see that on the other side, it's it's flooded, right? It's there's still water there. So 
this is to me a typical, typical maladaptation example. And very often they are infrastructural because infrastructure isn't flexible, right? Once we built it, it's really hard to change things. But like I said, it's not a totally new concept. The word really comes from the way that it's used in evolutionary biology. Um, what's interesting there, if you're any ecologist or biologist in the room, you will know this better than me, but the notion that we have kind of species that adapt well, I mean, just like adaptation comes from biology in the sense that uh, we adjust to the context around us as the environment changes over time, we can too. Uh, maladaptation is essentially when we adjust the wrong way. So if we were a butterfly, we might become lighter rather than darker when actually it's getting darker around us, but some for some reason we become lighter and so we're more visible. Um, and it's been labeled flawed in the sense that it was understood as something that actually doesn't really happen. Like you, you sort of, it's not that you try to do something and become dark and you actually accidentally become white. You're sort of on purpose trying to become white. Um, anyway, the people have, scholars from hazard and disaster studies from the 1970s and 1980s also use this concept. Uh, so it's really only in the 1990s that adaptation scholars start to use this, which makes sense because that's really also when adaptation to climate change was, was essentially born. But it's because of this empirical evidence that's now come through these many projects that we have such, why this is more trendy, but also this pressure that's put within the Paris Agreement that there's a global goal on adaptation. And this is putting pressure on countries to try to identify what is successful adaptation. And by needing to identify successful adaptation, we inevitably also have to try to understand how to avoid maladaptation. So I think it's um, what's fascinating, sorry, I'm, I should be using this actually. It's fascinating to me how much interest is growing. I mean, I think, I mean, I've been invited to write things and then I've talked to lots of journalists, but there's something about the dark side of climate policy, I think, that that fascinates people. Failures, you know, when we, when we get things wrong. Um, but so it's kind of, yeah, it's trending. But it's also, I think, because we've done re more research and sort of as the, the, the kind of number of critical adaptation scholars is also increasing, we have more, more fascinating work to, to look at. Um, this is just from one paper where that we that got a lot of attention that we published in, in World Development about two and a half years ago, where we found that many adaptation interventions are reinforcing, redistributing, or creating new sources of vulnerability. Not necessarily maladaptation every time, but that vulnerability is coming back to bite us, essentially. And... Um, so the, we had a few examples, and I think to make it concrete also, I mean, you saw the seawall in Fiji, but I think um, there's one project in Colombia where actually the Adaptation Fund had, um, it was a project that required selecting beneficiaries for a post-disaster housing scheme. Um, and the people had to be selected from the National Registry. So basically, you had to be registered in order to be able to benefit from this. And it's very complicated bureaucratically to, to register in the system. And so those who were unable who, who to, to navigate that basically couldn't be part of the project. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the institutional decision that we're going to have only these people who are going to benefit. And, and consequently, uh, we end up with people who, uh, many people who fall outside that. Sorry, let me just try to increase this so I can see what I'm going to say. Uh, very interesting also is that it's not always only adaptation projects that are planned externally, that are coming and funded ex um, externally. But um, Philip Antuigui and colleagues found in northern Ghana where people have actually started to abandon farming land because it was so difficult to farm. And so they're having so many failures. They ended up instead kind of going to the cities and getting employment, which is obviously a very common way of addressing difficulties in rural areas. And they, the hap, what happened though, was that people would be gone most of the time. And when the conditions for farming were good, there weren't enough people around to be able to actually farm. So they basically could have had the opportunity to have a successful harvest, but they couldn't because of the lack of people. Um, one study in Bangladesh, uh, which is quite uh, uh, by Farhana Sultana, 
she looked at how flood measures, if you look at it from a gendered perspective, um, she noticed that flood control, there were lots of sort of efforts to try to control flooding in some places. But those who made decisions about the flooding hadn't considered the fact that, in fact, when it was when the plains were flooding, it was giving opportunities for women. So women would go out and they would collect crabs and they would collect other things that they were able to, to sell then. And so they were basically relying on this flooding for their livelihoods. As soon as the flooding was prevented, that opportunity was no longer there. So the women suddenly were, were made worse off because of this. Uh, and then let's see. Well, I've already shown you the example from Fiji, so I don't need to go into that. So we can think about maladaptation in several different ways. I think that the, the key thing to think about, from my perspective, it's really when the people in question, instead of having an adaptation and benefiting from adaptation, they actually become more vulnerable to climate change. But in the literature, I have to be fair, the literature also uses it in slightly different ways as well. So we see also this notion of shifting or redistributing vulnerability. Uh, this is, for example, very typical when you have people upstream who decide that they're going to take water from the river for irrigation because it's too dry. People downstream then suffer because there's no water available or less water available for them, right? So that's kind of a classic case. Uh, you can also see any kind of um, measures that are taken to protect coastal settlements. Often you'll have other problems further, further down the coastline, erosion or other kinds of things that happen um, for other settlements. We can also talk about maladaptation when you get negative externalities from projects. And this is something I struggle a little bit with this one. I find this one uh, less, um, I'd rather not call this maladaptation, but the literature talks about it also that way. So for example, um, we have situations where um, one project where women were given access to microcredit to start their own projects and adaptation and actually the men were really jealous that the women had the success. And so domestic violence rose rapidly or significantly. And so, you know, that's obviously a f not increasing women's vulnerability to climate change explicitly, but obviously not something that we want to see as an outcome. So those are the kinds of ways that we can understand uh, maladaptation, but it's really hard. And one of the things that we struggle with as scientists is exactly trying to say, and maladaptation is already happening now, so let's shift the project, so do you ch make changes. Usually we can only see maladaptation with hindsight. It's usually only afterwards that, that we know about this. So related to that is when do we actually assess that an adaptation has been successful? Is it right after a project ends? Is it right after, or is it 10 years later? I mean, how do you say climate is constantly changing? Context is constantly changing. When do you decide that something has worked well? We also have a lot of questions about who should actually be benefiting or, or who is who who is adversely affected. I think, um, sorry, I don't mean who should be adversely affected. Obviously, nobody should be adversely affected. But I think um, th there are a lot of questions about sort of who is actually involved. There's so many actors involved in adaptation. Who who do we care about? Who who who? Obviously, we try to care about everybody. But what if you don't know about everybody? Also a lot of questions around what the purpose of initiative, original, sorry, the original purpose of initiatives is. And I think that here we come back to the, the point that adaptation to climate change is understood in so many different ways around the world. And so if we have a kind of very limited, um, I should would say like aspirations for what adaptation can be, then could also mean that we're not actually going to have a huge amount of impact and therefore things might be maladaptive. But similarly, because we don't really have a clear sense of what we're looking at, what is adaptation, what is successful adaptation, how can you assess, you know, what's the baseline against which you can assess progress or success? Um, so, right. So broadly speaking, you can categorize these types of maladaptations around infrastructure, I would say, around institutions and around behavior. So I already talked about infrastructure and behavior. Behavior, I would say, is a case from Ghana where people are migrating out. Institutional maladaptation is one, one example is, for example, crop insurance. You see examples 
not just in the global south, also in the global north, where people are have access to crop insurance. And as a consequence, they don't actually maintain their social networks that are important to understand kind of what are the conditions so that they know, you know, try to get tips from each other. This is an example, I think, from Canada, if I'm not wrong, uh, where people decided that they weren't that they didn't need to have these social networks any longer because they had insurance. So if things go wrong, they can rely on the insurance. But actually what happens is that that, that, that network of knowledge eroded. Those conversations ended and people didn't have that. That So of course, imagine that the insurance scheme ends and people have to go back to figuring things out themselves and they then have to rebuild their social networks for that. Um, so if you kind of broadly speaking across all the different different studies that are out there, adapt maladaptation seems to happen when there are shallow understandings of what drives vulnerability in specific locations in project design. So it's, we can't just broadly say this is what causes vulnerability. Every single case is different. We need to understand that context, that local context. And typically very much linked to that is when project design doesn't involve local people, when, when there isn't that kind of local knowledge, obviously, um, but also the ownership. What we see a lot, and I think ha ha happily, I think that it's just decreasing slightly, but I, yeah, uh, is a lot of kind of retrofitting adaptation into existing development programs. And this happens, for example, when you have a development program or project and you're like, oh, we could add, there's a pot of money here that is only for climate change activities. Why don't we add something into this project? By the way, we're not going to change the project. We're just going to add climate change adaptation into it. And if we don't rethink the project, we're likely not going to actually have any impact uh, or any effect on adaptation. So um, I think the lessons that we can draw from this is that we have to acknowledge these multiple actors who are involved in doing adaptation. There are funders, there are decision makers, there are um, then of course the people who adapt, but then there's power hierarchies among those. So if we, by acknowledging this, we can also acknowledge the power imbalances that we see uh, between all these different actors and recognize that some actors won't be invited to the table because they are marginalized on purpose. Uh, those are probably also going to be the ones who need to adapt the most or who are yeah. most vulnerable to climate change. But, and therefore these badly designed adaptation strategies can perpetuate uh, the inequity that actually causes vulnerability to climate change. So imagine one thing that we see over and over again is these um, project money that comes in, for example, to a capital city somewhere, and the decision makers are the ones who, you know, who get the money sitting in government. They are the elite, the ones who make decisions, and they also on purpose marginalize probably the ones who also never get to make any decisions. And so this sort of this is the institutional structures. They have to go through these processes, have to go through the, the, the capitals, they have to go through government. And so you end up continuing to marginalize people. Another way that this takes shape is, for example, when you have already worked with certain groups, like you, know, you have donors who come in and they've already got partnerships with certain groups and they want to work with them. Instead of faffing around lots of papers and trying to come up with additional um, you know, terms of reference to work with new groups, they decide oh, we're just going to continue to work with the groups. We already have a memorandum of understanding. We trust them and so on. But actually, those are groups that have already had a lot of exposure and probably a lot of, of access and, and privilege. And the other groups don't have the same. So it sort of it continues to sort of it perpetuates the situation. And again, just to highlight the fact that we have these differences in understanding of what adaptation and adaptation success is. And these make their way through, for example, in the way that we come up with indicators for what a successful project looks like. If we are quite happy with saying, okay, you know, now 50 people know and can use the word resilience versus now we can see some significant transformation in the way that people are doing agriculture here. I mean, I hopefully most projects are in the other direction or in the latter direction, but we know that of course it's not always the case. Um, and so uh, if we conceptualize adaptation as something very kind of technocratic, something very uh, tick boxy, simple, then it that's also probably going to mean that we're not really getting at what we need to do. And just a reminder about this, because I think this 
this continuum, the adaptation continuum is still, we still see lots and lots of projects that focus only on the impacts and too few projects that try to address the, the drivers, the underlying drivers of vulnerability. So how do we address this? I mean, obviously we need a better understanding of context. We need equitable participation. We need to avoid retrofitting adaptation and adaptation success or adaptation itself should be defined by local agendas, not by agendas coming from far away places. Um, right, so I think this sort of broadly just to give sort of a conceptual overview of this. Now to shift a little bit into thinking about, you know, how can you actually look at maladaptation on the ground? Um, so this paper came out uh, beginning of last week, um, Diana Rekin and colleagues, uh, and I have worked together in the IPCC six assessment report and working group two. And this was essentially one of the, the products. I mean, IPCC doesn't do research, but ultimately what you do when you assess literature is you end up collecting so much, putting it together that you actually do find still new things, right? When you see all of this aggregated. And having looked at all of these studies, it became clear that it's not actually necessarily the case that one strategy is specifically always going to be good and one strategy is always going to be bad. That is, any specific adaptation strategy is not always necessarily going to be maladaptive. So don't want to categorize things. I think that there's a, um, a bad reputation, for example, for irrigation. We, I already use it, irrigation as an example. It tends to be my go-to example, to be honest. You know, that irrigation in many places is water taking away from others. Like you take it for, for only for one group. Um, and I think that that is kind of, it, it really illustrates the notion of maladaptation, but does it really deserve that bad reputation? Maybe not always. And so I think it's important not to sort of blanket categorize things. I've talked badly about infrastructure. We have to be careful, but it doesn't mean that we can't do infrastructure well also maybe we can maybe we can uh so here that the notion is really to see that you know we've got um we can move through this continuum and you but it's really about how you implement the projects the context how you manage the funds who's involved all of those things those are the things that determine whether something becomes maladaptive or is successfully successful adaptation um, and we broke this down into, I mean, this is again, based on literature, trying to understand sort of what are the key things that seem to be dictating what kind of, which direction we go in. First of all, the number of people. So if we have a lot of people who are, could potentially benefit, we could see that this probably could be more adapt, a successful adaptation. If there are fewer people who would benefit from a strategy, then it could be kind of more in the maladaptation side. I think we can discuss about that because it depends a little bit also if it's majority of people but you're actually through that process marginalizing another group then maybe that's not so that's not so um good uh we talk also about one criteria of ecosystems and ecosystem services so thinking about ecosystems are ecosystems going to suffer as a result of an adaptation strategy then it's likely to be maladaptive as i said earlier we need to keep in mind also that that ecosystems also have limits to adaptation right so we can't be completely reliant on them either do strategies increase greenhouse gas emissions? If yes, then it could be maladaptation. Uh, if you ask me personally, I don't think this category belongs here, but it is in the literature, right? So it, it's there. Um, we don't want that. We don't want everybody to have air conditioning. I mean, you know, obviously as it gets hotter and hum more humid, everybody should deserve to have a cool space to work in. But if we all just have air conditioning, then we're going to have a significant amount of greenhouse gas emissions also. Um, just as an aside, I think it's interesting in where I have a small house in Sweden and in this area is very trendy now to build black houses. And Sweden, of course, is not very, very hot in the summer, right? But it's interesting to me that when I asked my neighbors, don't you experience that it's really hot inside your house because it is getting hotter during the summer? Yeah, yeah, we installed an air conditioning. I'm thinking Sweden in air conditioner in the summer. But if you make your house black with your roof black, of course. So, you know, I just, um, just as a, a little aside. Um, the other criteria is systemic change. So do you see again here kind of, if you think about this transformative versus incremental adaptation, is it actually thinking about how we shift institutions, how we make changes that will 
break down the power structures that will re rejig things so that we avoid the inequities that we see otherwise? Or does it entrench these inequities? Does it retain the inst institutions that perpetuate poverty, inequality? Then it definitely could be maladaptive. Does the, the, the strategy focus on low-income groups or is it only geared towards high-income groups? Again, this is something that we can use to determine. Where do women and girls play? And it's not that all the, pro the strategies have to focus on women and girls, but what we don't want is strategies that, like I talked about Bangladesh example, where women and or girls are worse off as a result of the strategy. And then similarly, marginalized ethnic groups, again, we don't want to see strategy that makes things worse for those people. So you can look at this more carefully. Like I said, I'm not going to go into it in huge detail, but um, we map this against the, the key risks that are laid out also in Chapter 16 of the Working Group 2 report. And I think that it, it's really at this point a conceptual tool to try to say that, you know, we certain types of strategies are, you know, if you look at these criteria, they're bigger green circles. That means they're more adapt adaptation, successful adaptation. But if you see brown there, and I'm not sure how easy this is if you have colorblind, but um, the if you see more brown, that means that it's more likely to be maladaptation. But I think this is I think this is a useful approach. But I I just want to emphasize another kind of, um, you know this idea that adaptation is not inherently good or bad. I think ultimately this to me is sort of the key message here. And here I want to pull up this uh, picture that is from a paper that we published in um, July, I think, that was on locally led adaptation, which is a very, very trendy topic, but for a reason, because it's trying to sort of emphasize the need for ownership, for, uh, for management of adaptation funding from the bottom, from the local people. That's not to say that it can't still have problems. And I think this paper in particular, we investigate the kind of potentially kind of pitfalls with this approach that where you can still, even on a local level, you'll have power differences. You'll have some people who are elite, that some people who are marginalized. So the here, but I like this picture because it, it brings sort of this notion that the blue people, the people coming externally bringing funding, gradually they sort of disappear. And the people who have more ownership and implement the projects are the green people, the people, the local people, which also I think is an ideal. It's probably not likely to, that this is going to be the model everywhere, but I think it's an important, uh, it's an important way to remind us that What's happening right now is the decisions are made elsewhere, and that context, the local context, doesn't get um, doesn't get integrated very often. So, okay, so I just said that <laughs> it's how it's implemented, the context and the participatory nature of the process that influences this. So, I think uh, coming towards the end, I think ish, um, the you know broadly adaptation strategies that are poorly planned mostly the planning also implemented can result in maladaptation. And we should be careful not to refer to maladaptation just as bad outcomes from all any kind of climate intervention. This really should be specifically when we're talking about adaptation. Um, but this to me is the most important thing. There are many ways to improve adaptation that can also help avoid maladaptation. So we're not succeeding very much in adaptation clearly, but whatever we do will improve our chances of also avoiding maladaptation. The funding structures the adapta and adaptation of practices, now we see very much an extension of development practice. These are also to blame. It's the way that funding requires us to think about, the funders require to think about sort of these cycles of funding, the way, you know, distinguishing between adaptation development as a result of this notion of additionality of new and additional finance, uh, which has merit, but it creates, has created this very artificial divide between adaptation and development. These are also to blame uh, in, in perpetuating this problem and creating potentially maladaptation. And I think that one thing that we see over and over again is that there's this notion that climate change is something separate from other development challenges or the, other, the rest of the development agenda. And I think that can also increase the risk of maladaptation. So we come back to these kinds of questions about how do we detect maladaptation before it happens? Who should be addressing this? I mean, of all the actors, is it who who's actually, I've been doing a lot of this, <laughs> these presentations recently to development agencies. I think they had an aha moment about kind of the importance of avoiding maladaptation. And it's great to see 
and I hope that it's not just going to be an inv invitation for a webinar and then they hope everybody knows what the word maladaptation means and then they all go off and continue to do what they did before, but rather a rethinking. Um, but I mean, I think, you know, from their perspective also is this problem actually locked into the way that we do development in development aid, development um, cooperation, in particular, the time span of projects, like I said before. Is adaptation always about reducing vulnerability? I mean, I'm obviously a huge advocate for that. That's my the, <laughs> one of the papers that I've written. I say, until vulnerability reduction is at the heart of adaptation measures, the risk of maladaptation will continue to linger. I really believe that. But there could be also an argument for adaptation strategies that don't necessarily only address vulnerability, that also address impacts of climate change kind of more superficially. So I think, I, yeah, so kind of the key points I wanted to, to you to remember is that, and this has come something that I'm becoming increasingly concerned about as I talk a lot about maladaptation. Just because maladaptation is a risk, this does not mean that adaptation shouldn't be funded. And I worry a lot, uh, I get this question from journalists, like, so you're saying adaptation doesn't work. And that's not what I'm saying. I think the point is that there are many, many things that we can do to make adaptation better. And that's really what we need to focus on. So we have, you know, if you talk about the, the trees, like, you know, maybe the lowest hanging fruit are, are picked already, but there's still some accessible fruit. I mean, we have a lot of things that we can do to, to improve adaptation. One absolutely huge thing, uh, and this is something I try to drive home when I talk to the different development agencies, is that if organizations, particularly NGOs and others who implement uh, projects, are more open with sharing their mistakes when they fail with adaptation, then we would have a much better understanding of what causes maladaptation. But yeah, nobody wants, I mean, even I, am I going to come to the funder that funded my research and say, oh, I really screwed up now. Please give me some more money. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's... It, I understand, but I think that that dialogue absolutely has to happen. So we need to kind of like emphasize the need for learning in this process. And that's why I'm trying to talk about this atmosphere of learning in order to improve adaptation and see how we can kind of speak about this in a way that actually kind of rather than saying, okay, they screwed up, they're bad. Um, see, okay, let's build on this and, and see how we can improve things in the future. So obviously easier said than done, but I think that's the key thing. So yeah. That's what I'm going to say today. <laughs> <laughs>